I would get leading roles with them, you know, in middle school. Not to toot my own horn, but uh, and now I do nothing. <laughs> now I do podcasts, wondering if I can piss off a balcony. Fire, <laughs> yo, what? Bro, you gotta piss off this balcony. We're heard? we're pissing off the balcony tonight. This episode is brought to you by AMG. If you're involved in any type of accident, don't hesitate to call 305 AMG Help. They are the winning team and they will have your back. Bro, I'm not, I'm not much of a fan. I put nah. in a six and I instantly regret it. It's a three. I'll take a three. It's a three for little boys like us. <laughs> for little cute boys like us, like Let you and me. See. The starter pack. <laughs> exactly. Cheers. Cheers. We're, Cheers. we're cute little boys. Shout out to Zen. Shout out to Zen. Are we recording? Yo, today in the we're Miami Hustle, we got Luis Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> pulling up, pulling up. Thank you All for right. your time. Yeah, bro, we're starting. All right. And that's it. If, uh, if I feel crazy, I'll ask for another three. We got him. That's what now. we got him. That's what God invented them for. Yeah, I should be fine. You're going to be good. We're going to be good. We're going to be good. No, things so are good. I laced these with fentanyl, though. Oh, for real? Yeah, so they're going to be really good. Damn, bro. So you're going to feel it. That's kind of wild. No, nah, man. Fentanyl is the fun. right dosage? I call it fentanyl. Fentanyl, man. So, <laughs> What's fun about it? Huh? Everything. <laughs> there, there's no downsides to fentanyl. All right, and um, this, epi gonna... this episode gets canceled. Within the Immediately. First minutes. <laughs> My brother. Was a drug addict. <laughs> Fuck you, you know? Oh, just so everybody knows, Louis Diaz is a comedian, so don't take anything he says too serious. We're allowed to say shit like this because you're a comedian. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean any of it. Nah, so we're good, bro. Yo, so let's start off by telling everybody where you're from. Born and raised in Miami. I've been to Disney a couple times. But other than that, that's I've lived here. I've, I'm always in Miami. Nice. Uh, that's it, bro. I went to, every time I've traveled, it's been to Mexico or... Or England or Canada, but it's all in Epcot, so that's it. Oh shit! It's all in Epcot. It's <laughs> all my travel. in Orlando, then. No, I stay in Miami. This is, I, yeah, man. Born and raised in Miami, Kendall. And Shout out Kendall. Probably didn't leave Kendall until I went to college. Where'd you go to high school? Went to Ferguson. Ferguson, yo, shout out Ferguson. And you take Miller Drive until you hit Alligators, and then you keep going a little bit, and you hit Ferguson. How was uh, Ferguson for you? How was the high school days? What type of student were you? I was half gay, so I did musical theater. <laughs> And Yo, what? I, half, 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 bro. I mean, bi, some people call bi it bi. Half. No, I never put anything in my mouth. But like, okay. you thought, um, about it. You thought about it, dude. Hey, you're around. No, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> uh, no, I did theater and I played football. And I was like Troy Bolton. <laughs> um, That's crazy. Theater and football. Theater and football. Did you get picked on in the football field? No, because I, I, I would. Did knock people out not knock nice. people out i wasn't even here's the thing is i was like a bench warmer because i didn't fuck with practice like on practice i'd half-ass everything and so like my coach never trusted me in a game but when i would go in a game it was a wrap like I, okay. I my entire highlight reel was against like south dade like our first game like my that was my highlight reel because college scouts were there to see south dade players and i'm here i was a center so i'd be pancaking motherfuckers Fire. um <laughs> Not to do my, I was pretty good, but I never, I didn't get a lot of playing time because I, I hated practice. I'm like, what are we doing here? Same thing with when I did theater. I hated rehearsals. I'm like, we know our lines. What do we do? Ew, you we're were fucking, that confident? I, yeah. I've always been, okay. I've always been very delusionally confident in okay. what I do. So how was theater for you? I loved it, bro. I you first show to that first <laughs> show was in third grade. I played Papa Bear and Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Damn. Fucking was gay from there. I loved that shit. I loved theater. I loved performing. Uh, went to middle school, always did theater there. Um, two dudes I went to middle school with are like super famous actors now. One of them was in 13 Reasons Why, uh, and the other one was in Glee, but he got canceled, so we're not going to pretend like we were friends, even though we were friends before he was a dickhead. Um, and he was on Glee, and he went to Varela. The other one uh, went to New World School of the Arts, and then went to New York, and 13 Reasons Why. He's on Broadway, so the guy's fucking kicking ass. Brandon Flynn, love that fight. Guy's awesome. And I would get leading roles with them, you know, in middle school. Not to toot my own horn, but uh, and now I do nothing. I, <laughs> now 
Now I do podcasts wondering if I can piss off a balcony. Fire. <laughs> Yo, what? <laughs> Bro, you got to piss off this balcony. We're, ever- we're pissing off the balcony tonight. That's what we're doing. I'm looking at all the cameras. Have you ever pissed off a balcony? Hell yeah. How high up? Uh, it was in the embassy suites by the airport. <laughs> it was in 2013. And I think we we're on the eighth floor. Was that a big moment for you? That was a fun day for me because that was the day I realized I talk way too much when I'm drunk. I was sitting down. I pissed off the balcony. I came inside. I was talking so much, talking so much. And my buddy looked at me, Rudy, and he goes, hey, you're talking too much. Damn. And I literally got introspective. I'm like, I am talking too much. And so that was a good day for me. I learned were about you, myself. Were you saying too much or just talking too much? No, talking too much. I, I never say too much. I'm, I, I can get drunk, but. So what made you want to piss off a balcony? Uh, I like peeing outside. I've always loved peeing outside. Piss on grass. Piss on Mother Earth. You give back to her what she gives to you. Oh, beautiful. Mwah. It's poetic. <laughs> it's poetic. This is fake turf grass. I can't, this does nothing. Yeah. I'll pee on it if you want me to, but like, nah, it's just going to make it smell weird. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather you piss off the balcony. Off the balcony. Yeah, as we should. Yeah. Do you try to hit people when you piss off the balcony? No, 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 no. Respectful? I'm not disrespectful. Okay, okay. Just but I'm also not checking where I'm going either, okay, you know? Okay, got you. So how often do you piss outside then? Whenever you get the chance? Honestly, like whenever, try to? whenever I get the chance. When I lived in my parents' house, because now I live in an apartment because I'm poor and the American dream has died. But like when, <laughs> yeah. when my parents had the American dream and they could buy a house with land and a backyard and shit, bro, I'd wake up, brush my teeth, go outside, take my morning piss. Beautiful. Awesome. You brush your teeth in the bathroom and yeah, take of course. your morning like, piss How are you going to brush your teeth outside? There's no <laughs> running water. I'm not going to go to a hose. I'm not fucking Dominican Republic, third world country over here. I, I have a f- bathroom for a reason. <laughs> so do you save water doing that too, I guess, when you just piss outside all the time? I don't give a fuck. Oh, shit. The water's there. It's gonna get filtered and come back. That's so I don't. I don't do it for the water saving. I do it for me. What's your craziest piss, pissing outside story? <sighs> Might. Be, oh, uh, are you well, conscious of like where you're pissing, or if it's outside, it's it's fair game. I, I'm not pissing on people. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, my best peeing outside story. This is like full on gay. Uh, when I was in a frat, there was one day we were, we were just like having like a. A brother's day. And so it was just guys, real nice. And someone, and it was like in Doral and the hot backyard had a lake. And one guy goes to piss in the lake. And another guy goes to piss in the lake. And ended up like someone realized the game. And everyone started. For, and just all, the entire Sigma Alpha Mu chapter, Delta Zeta chapter, just pissing next to each other in the lake. And it's, <laughs> you keep your eyes forward and it's not gay. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah. And that's, that's the rules. And that, that's, my, that's my favorite pissing outside story. That's fire, bro. Did anyone get caught wandering around with their eyes? And no, because I, I keep my eyes focused. So if you're looking at me, I, I, my peripherals are bad. I got LASIK for forward vision, not for my peripherals. <laughs> Yo, so then out of high school, where did life take you? So uh, I always wanted to be an actor. And I wanted to audition to... AMDA, I wanted to audition to the Juilliards, I wanted to audition to every theater school. And my parents were like, nah, you're, you're the man of the family, you're not, you're not going away from school to do theater. And I was like, okay, that's fine. So I went to FIU and I auditioned for the theater program there. Got a little bit of a scholarship to do theater at FIU. My parents were like, oh, you, you misunderstand. No son of ours is Cuban. So if you do theater, and they're like, no, no, you're not doing theater for school. You can have fun with that. That was fun in high school, but you got to study shit for a real job. So theater's like comiendo mierda. To them, yeah. And now my younger sister is studying musical theater at NYU. Get the fuck out of here. Is, but she's a girl, so it's different she's or no? a, She's a girl. She's also 10 years younger than me, so she was raised different. She was raised like when I to see that. Did you ever think about becoming a girl so it could be more acceptable? Uh, nah. Okay. Cool. Nah, I'm not gay. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck do you think I am? No, no, I'm a man. Good. You never know, bro. Some people are willing to do anything to make it into the acting world, you know? Bro, there's, they, you, there's fucking shitty athletes that are willing to be girls just so they can be a good athlete again. No, fuck you. You're a man that sucks at what you do. Yeah, that's wild. Fuck you, Leah Thomas. Yeah, fuck that. I hope you hear me. She's not listening to Miami Hustle. I hope not. I, he's I not wanna... listening to Miami Hustle. Yeah, I don't I know what to call him. It. It's all good, bro. Can't hear it because he's in the water. So. so then how did that affect your decision to like stay with it and stick to comp or not? So not yeah, acting? I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So when <clears> I went to college and I couldn't do theater anymore, I loved radio as well. Like when I was in college, in high school, I was in the TV, I was in the morning announcements and shit too. So I was like, Bro, you know that what, that's fine. before Bluetooth. So radio was popping. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I enjoyed it. So I was like, you know what, if I can't study theater, uh, I'll study broadcasting. And, and I wasn't that mad. Um, 
but I missed being on stage. And one day I'm at home and I'm watching Comedy Central and I'm watching the stand up and it, it just clicked in my head. I'm like, that's a stage and I can I can fucking do that. I don't need to worry about waiting for the next audition because when you're when you're an actor, you've you, especially in like a city with with very few acting troops and acting companies, they're, they're, you audition for one season. So you, and they're all around the same time. So you get like maybe four or three auditions if you're not a union. I, and you audition for all the seasons. And if you don't get a role that season, you got to wait the calendar year to audition again. So it's and, like tryouts. Exactly. And so <clears throat> I, I got tired of waiting to be on stage. And so I tried stand up out. And I had done stand up in high school for the talent show and in middle and elementary school for the talent show. I was like, fuck it, let me do stand up. Like, let me try it. And first show went great. I was like, okay, shit, maybe, we, maybe we're onto something. Second show went god awful. So bad. Everyone that came to the first show was like, man, Lewis, you, you can do this. And they came to the second show like, maybe stick to radio. Maybe. And I didn't. And I just kept going after it. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how it was. I, I, I was a theater kid without a stage. And I just wanted to be on stage and talk to people. I've always been, like, I guess like an extrovert where all my energy comes from others. Like, and then that's, that's how I am. Like, I need to feed off others. And so, like, I, that's why I like doing stand-up. That's probably what you were talking about at the party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I need to be around other people. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, bro. So tell me about with the second one that it went terrible. Like what, what happened that made it go terrible? Dog, did so, you freeze up or the no, jokes no, no, just no, weren't no. hitting? It, it's just the jokes weren't hitting at all. You get, I got confident in my first show. And this happens to a lot of young comics, probably every young comic. And where you'll, you'll, you'll have a confident show. Sometimes people don't do well on their first. And whenever you do well, you get real confident. And whatever you did to prepare for that first one, you're riding that confidence. You've got this hubris about you, this pride, like, oh shit, I got this made. So for the second one, I didn't prepare as much. I did a whole new different set, which is crazy because I've never written stand-up before in my life. And now all of a sudden I think I got a good five minutes here. I can write a whole other good five minutes and say it for the first time without rehearsing it throughout the day or the week leading up to it. Yeah, you got copy. So I didn't prepare for it. I got on stage knowing what I was going to say. And it's not like I forgot what I was going to say. I just, it just wasn't funny because I was like stuttering through it, not prepared, not fully confident in what I was saying. And brother, when you're on stage, the one thing you need is confidence. Confidence in yourself. Be your authentic self. Be you. And if you're a funny person off stage, if you can be you on stage, you're going to be funny. And I wasn't. And that's that's what made me suck ass on my second show. And did you like, did you know that even though you sucked, you're going to keep going? Or did you have moments of like, damn, I don't know? I, of course, yeah. You, of course I got the doubt. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't. But then I got really bored again, like a, a month later, two months later. I'm like, fuck, I want to get back on stage. Let me try it again. And I went on the third time. Sucked again. But for some reason, I was like, right, but let's keep going. Like there, I didn't have any doubt. I was like, let me just keep going. Let me just get that first set that I did that worked. Let me try and just build off that. And that's the way to do it. You, you get a good one minute. That you turn into a good two, turn into a good three. And you just keep growing from there. How long are, are your stand-ups usually, like when you were starting? When, when you start, you're getting five minutes anywhere. And that's, that's all I was doing. And I'm a, I've always been a big believer of a good three minutes is better than a half ass five. So, like, if I was doing three minutes killing and that was all my material for the night, I wasn't going to stay on stage and try and ruin that's it. Right. Like, I'd rather get off there. And people are like, man, I wish I could have seen you more. It's like, well, see <laughs> me next time. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, and so I was doing maybe three to five minutes. And... So how long ago was that when you eight first started? Eight years ago. And how's it been these last eight years? It's been fucking, it's been a journey, you know? But it's been fun, bro. I, I, I've always been half delusional, you know? I feel like you have to be. If you want to make yeah. it in, in these one in a million type of industries, you want to be a pro athlete, you want to be a professional entertainer, you, you've got to be delusional. Because your whole life you're hearing, when I was a kid and I was playing uh, Little League Baseball, I told my grandpa, hey, I'm going to be Mike Lowe when I grow up. Third base for the Marlins. Win a World Series. And my grandpa was like, hey, no, you're not. <laughs> Granted, I sucked at baseball, so he was right. <laughs> but, like, you've got to believe you are that one in a million. Yeah. And so I, I just had that mindset that I'm, I'm going to be that one in a million. I mean, there's more than a million people here in Miami. So that means multiple of us statistically are going to be the ones to make it. Why not me? 
I, 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 I've always told people that, that are starting, it's one in a million. That means everyone here wants to be a stand-up comic. One in a million of those people are going to be famous stand-up comics. But of that million, not everyone's actually trying. So as soon as you get on stage and you try, now that's one and a half million. Your odds just doubled like that. The, as soon as you start getting regular stage time at the improv, do you know how hard it is to be a regular at the improv? Once you do that, that's one in a quarter million. Your odds just doubled again. And the, the longer you work at it, the more you just literally don't quit and keep working, your odds just keep getting better and better because everyone is quitting behind you, making it easier for you. Yeah, but that's fire. <clears throat> that's good math right there. I like that. That's, that's, I don't know if it's real statistics, but <laughs> it makes sense though. That's the way I see it. And if I just don't stop, and I keep working at my craft, meaning I'm going to keep getting better. I mean, shit, what is it? They say luck. There's no such thing. Luck is just hard work and timing, right? You got to wait for the timing. True. And like you said, the more you're out there, the better timing is going to catch exactly. up with you. So how, how does one like a comedian keep it consistent when it comes to finding new shows to perform at? Or, or do you just, are you just doing open mics? Like, how are you trying to get yourself out there in the beginning? So in the beginning, it's you got to put yourself in the right, right positions. Um, and that's something not a lot of comics know. Not a lot of comics realize, I should say, uh, because they're, they're out here. There's actually a bar right down over there that does an open mic on Mondays thank and Fridays. You, thank you, Miami, right Shout over there. Thank you, Miami. No, fuck them. And, oh, shit. And, no, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you, Alex. Damn, and no. There's a bar right, thank you, Miami's right down there. Uh, and there's, there's bar shows. And there's people that started eight years ago when I started. And they're just content doing these bar shows. Like I said, I've always been delusional. I've, always, I'm gonna, I've got higher aspirations for myself. So I put myself in the right position. So I got a job at the Improv. So that's the only professional club you in the city. You got a job at the Improv? I got a job at the you're Improv. Not, you're performing comedy there as a job? I was, just... doing, I was doing the sound at the Improv. And that's the hustle sh right there. showed them, hey, I've got good work ethic. And on the open mics, I'd go up and I'd do well on stage. So not only do they know I have this, the chops, but I also have the work ethic because I'm never late. I'm always doing my job. I'm staying late, getting there early, doing everything that's asked of me, and then some. And all of a sudden, hey, the opener for No Se Yang didn't show up. Can you go up and host this show? Fire. And I do it, and, and I did well. And hey, can you finish doing the weekend? Okay. Hey, in three months, and No Se Yang's coming down, they needed us to book an opener. Can you do that weekend? Let me check my calendar. Uh, yeah, like if I can, I'm a nobody. So I've got everything open. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what you've got to do. You've got to put yourself in the right spot. When I worked in radio, when I, when I first got into college, I was like, I'm going to be Elvis Duran. I'm going to be Ricky Smiley, a little lighter, but Ricky Smiley without a tan. And I knew I'm not going to just apply for shit radio station at FIU, the student station. I'm going to go to the biggest companies. And whether it's a janitor, whatever, I'm just going to get my foot in the door. And that's always been my mindset. I'm going to put myself in the right position, let my work speak for itself. And that's what I did with stand-up. I got whatever job at the, at the improv that I was hiring at that time was the sound guy. I was like, I'll take it. And just work as much as I can, prove my worth, show my worth, and climb that, climb that ladder. Because like I said, I was not going to be one of these guys that are just performing at these bar open mics every week doing the same material like that i got i got bigger dreams than that bro yeah i feel like that's more of like like to practice i guess i i use those bars i still go to those bar shows when i've got a new hour coming up and oh okay it, like miami being my home club this is a place i headline the most if i'm doing an hour for you i can't do the same hour the next time you come or else you're not gonna be that it's, you're not you might i do one show a lot of people come out, they love it. They're gonna buy tickets to my next show. If I do the same hour, they're not buying tickets to a third show. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if, I, if I've got a new headlining date at the improv, I'll go to these shit bars, work on that hour there, so that way when the people come to pay me and pay me money, pay for the tickets, shit's fucking expensive. To, you gotta pay for the tickets, you got a two drink minimum, you got your date, you gotta, you, you gotta eat, and it, it's an expensive, I gotta be worth it. So that's why I use those shit rooms to make sure I'm worth it. Yeah, it's like practice. You exactly. Gotta, you got to put in the time. You've got to. <clears throat> Bro, I like what you said about how you got a job at the improv just to be around. Yeah. Like, that's huge. 100%. And at that point, you're pretty much going all in on comedy or you still like to doing the sound? And I was doing, 
I was working in radio. Still. How was that, by the way? What, what radio station? I, I worked on, before COVID, I worked at Power 96. I was the third mic with Zog and Lucy. That's big time. And it was awesome. It was my, it was my dream uh, at the time. Like, my, my dream was, like, how Ricky Smiley does radio in the morning and stand-up shows on the weekends. Bro, Power 96, the Marlins, it's pretty close. You're not a third baseman, but you're Dude, in the radio station. I was a third mic, third <laughs> baseman. There you go, there you go. Uh, on, on one of the best stations in Miami. And I and I I had worked in a few different stations on my way up there. And that was in no way going to be where I retire. But, like, it was a good place to be, especially at my age. I was 25 when nice. I got that job. That's a job that usually people in their mid-30s big get. big time, yeah. And just by putting myself in the right positions. I... That, I, uh, I, I if, if people listen to this shit for advice as a comic, put yourself in the right fucking position. Don't waste time. Skip the line. Don't waste time going to these bars and then going to the improv. No, man, just go to the fucking improv. If you want to work in radio, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll do this. I'll do a podcast. No, man, fucking if you want to work in radio, get a job in radio. If you want to do something on your own, do it. Don't skip the line. Don't, don't wait for when you're ready. Just get there and get ready. True. Whatever yeah, job yeah. you get, whether it's working at a restaurant, working, you're, you're going to learn on the job anyway. Just be in the right spot. That's what's up, bro. Yo, this Zen, I'm feeling it. It's good. How are you feeling? It's good. <laughs> I don't really Zen often, so I'm feeling the... You feeling the buzz? Little spins. It's a little spins. It's, it's a little groovy. A little wavy. A little, little wavy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's nice, though. If it was a six, I'd be fucked right now. Oh, no, I, I'd have taken it out 10 minutes ago. Yeah, bro, fuck that. <laughs> no but, way. <laughs> yo, so how does one uh, train or, or prepare for these moments in comedy? Like, what's your creative process when you're writing jokes? So... How often do you practice, like... I... There's different kinds of, of comic. You've got the observational comics, like Bill Burr, where he can go to Subway, and he there's a he has a joke that's like seven minutes long about going to Subway. He doesn't say it's Subway, but you go to a sub shop and it's like that observational humor, that's his shit. That's great for him. Like I said, you've got to be your authentic self on stage first. Just to tear down that wall between stage and people, if you're yourself talking to that one person, yeah, it's 400 people in the room. If you're talking to that one person and that one, and you're talking to everyone as individuals, as yourself, it's a lot easier. And for me, when I first started, I was just trying to think of funny things. I found out what made me funny offstage was just telling stories. Telling stories about what happened to me, uh, my cousin, my shit. I, I realized at Noche Buena, if there was a story about my sister, people would come to me for the story rather than my sister. Nice. <laughs> and, and so I... What do I do? I just live my life trying to see, ah, shit made me laugh. Let me write that down. It's a funny, I can turn that into a bit. I can say that story on stage. And when I've got a story that I add my jokes to, obviously, to make it funnier, when I got that, then I'll go to the bars, go to the bar shows, the open mics around the city, and I'll try them out. And I'll see what's funny there. Like, what of this five minutes is funny? Maybe I start off with a 10-minute story. I might end up with a three-minute story. I might start off with a five-minute story, ends up being a 12-minute story because I started adding so much to it. And, and what I do to prepare is just I, I work it. I say the story a lot. I say it on, everywhere I can just to find what makes people laugh about it. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel when you're on stage, though? Because one thing is practicing the jokes and, and understanding the ones that are funny and the ones that could hit or not. But when you're on stage and you don't have the jokes in front of you, how hard is that? I'm at home. Okay, fire. I'm at home. I, like I said, I, I don't speak to the 400 people in the room. I speak to the individuals. And so for me, it's I, when I'm on stage, I want you to feel like it's Thanksgiving, it's Noche Buena, and I'm just the guy in the middle. Because you go to Noche Buena, you've got the guys around the domino table, and one by one, each of them is telling something funny, and everyone's dying laughing, fucking putting everything down, right? I want you to feel like it's just me for an hour i want you to feel like you're at a party you're at home you're with your friends and i'm just telling you funny stories and so because it's all stories that have happened to me stories that are real it's not like i have to remember anything crazy true okay. i lived it i just got to convey it to you now yeah i always wonder sometimes like when comedians tell stories how real are the stories you're saying yours are, are all legit 80 to 85 percent true i've got to embellish some small details here and there it's just to make it funnier, but like the meat of the story, 
is true. The end of the story is usually pretty accurate. But then there's little details here and there just to make it funnier. Uh, I, <laughs> my mom went to one of my shows once. My, my first time headlining at the Improv. And like I said, it's 85% true. And I'm in the middle of a story and I say something a little more embellished than it really happened. And my mom, who had already had a few in her, and I goes, that's not what happened. I'm like, mom, Ew. shut the fuck up right now. <laughs> There's no way it's my first time headline. I'm being heckled by my that mom. Was first time headline. First time headline. So the second time I headline, wow. I bring her into the green room, bring her and my dad. I'm like, hey, these are the stories I'm going to say. I've changed this, this, and this, and this. And I go through it. I'm like, shut the fuck <laughs> up when I'm on stage, please. I don't do it. Just please. That's, that's how it's going to go down. And so for me, it's, it's mostly true. Little things here and there that I add, embellish, it's mostly true. Like if I tell that's someone perfect. that my daughter, like he, there was a story that was 100% true that I had to stop staying on stage because people thought it was fake. When my daughter was two or three years old, babe, bet you won't, was Mackenzie two or three? She was three years old. She didn't want to pick up anything in the class. And so after arguing with the teacher, like she's saying no, the teacher's like, yo, pick up. She's saying no. The teacher finally goes, hey, if you're going to act like a baby, I'll send you to the baby class. And my three-year-old daughter said, I bet you won't. Three years old, telling the teacher, I bet you won't. And I used to stay on stage because that shit cracked me the fuck up. <laughs> and that was 100% accurate, that story. People come up to you, all right, what does she really say? I'm like, she fucking said, I bet you won't. And I wouldn't you know, get a good laugh because people didn't believe it. And I'm like, fuck, I had to retire that joke. I love that story. Had to retire it. You retired it? I and can't say true. it on stage because wow, people don't believe it. Bro, I mean, it's for me, it's believable because I had that similar situation happen to me, but it was a fifth grader. My first job, I was like a summer Fuck camp yeah, counselor. summer camp counselor. Bro, I had the fourth graders going into fifth graders. So in the summer, you know, they're like the big shots of the Oh, school. yeah. Bro, I had this one kid. He's a troublemaker. I told him if he doesn't stop, I'm going to send him to the office. And he goes, he goes, oh, yeah. He gets his lunchbox and he goes, I'll go myself. And he just left. That's fucking great. I was like, damn. So I had to like make a decision. Do I follow that kid and make sure he's okay? Or do I, and then leave everyone alone? Or yeah. do I stay with everyone and call on the walkie talkie? So I decided to just stay in the class. Didn't call for help because it would have made me look bad. So I just let him go. And I was like, fuck, hopefully he's okay. Hopefully he gets there. <laughs> hopefully he's okay. He comes back after like five minutes. And I was like, yeah, what's up? I thought you were in the office, huh? And he's like, <laughs> and I'm like, go over there, sit down. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, call them, yeah, they're fourth graders. They're saying more shit. Yeah, yeah. No, it's wild, bro. Those kids are wild. But yeah, that, that But at three? At three, she told her teacher, I bet you won't. Were you and like I kinda, didn't were you, believe it. Were you kind of proud of that? hundred percent proud. Yeah, Took her be, out to fucking McDonald's and Cold Stone <laughs> after that. I was like, good shit. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was awesome. I thought it was, I thought it was hilarious. For and sure. the teacher <laughs> found it funny as shit too, but she couldn't laugh in front of her. And yeah, I got that story verified. I was like, I thought I was like verified. I was like, <laughs> miss. She said, I bet you won't. She's like, I, she said, I bet you won't. And That's Mackenzie's hilarious. standing right there. She's like, I said that. And I'm what like, did the teacher say? How did she even react to that? Oh, she sent her to the baby class. Okay. <laughs> She's like, you want to fucking bet? You lose. That's what's up. I mean, straight to nap time, I guess. Yeah. Oh, no. She, she was chilling. She, was, she fucking ran that class. That's smart, bro. Yeah. That's what's up. <laughs> Yo, so how, where is comedy taking you ever since then after working at improv and now you're getting these chances and now you're thriving in it? Have you been able to travel like outside of Miami to do comedy? Yeah, yeah. How's that been? Started. Is, I feel like it's a whole different crowd, right? Like, how do you it's, adjust? It's dope. A lot of comics, especially <clears throat> Miami. Miami people love themselves. My people love themselves. They love hearing about themselves. So a lot of comics, when they're young, they write Miami jokes. So if you go to an open mic in Miami, you're hearing the Palmetto. And a fucking guy's turning signals and, and <laughs> colada, cafecito, yeah, croqueta. Yeah. And you're hearing the same shit. And me, I, was, I never liked that Miami humor. So I've always, especially with my stories, they're not Miami-centric. If I'm in Miami, I'll throw in some Miami details. Like when I got arrested for having a fake ID, I can mention I should have put one, two, three, four, five Bird Road like everyone else did. When I'm in Tampa performing that, when I'm out of town performing that, I can mention it, but I can't stress it as much as I do down here. Um, so the only difference is the, the specificities, the specifics of the story I take out. Um, but it, it's, I, I prepared for it. I, my stories are, are family stories. And my favorite thing is when I'm in Sarasota, Tampa, Naples, I haven't really broken out of Florida yet. Um, but when I'm in those cities, uh, everyone comes up to me and whether they're white, 
So, like, I'll have a Cuban lady come up to me at the meet and greet. Like, oh, my God, I'm from Miami. I'm Cuban. I related to everything so much. And I'm like, that kind of hurts me a little bit. I'm like, I'm not doing this for the... I, I love my people, Cuban, my Cuban-American. But, like, I'm trying to expand. But then the guy right after, especially in Naples, old white dude, I am not Cuban, but <laughs> I love your stories. My son is the same way. And it's like, yeah, that's what I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm going for that. And, and it's, it's dope. I, I, I haven't really... Th- knock on wood, it'll come soon, but... God willing, no. I, I, I've had really good shows outside of Miami. Just being myself, man. It's, it's been dope. That's what's up, bro. I would, I would imagine that it's like harder to connect with people. I mean, it makes sense if you're from Miami and you're used to that crowd, used to those jokes. You go out there, it's not going to make any sense to them. I've, I, so I was in Naples and I brought a Miami comic to open for me, and he was doing Miami jokes and he fucking bombed. And after the show, he was like, ah. I don't know what was wrong with the crowd. I'm like, I can tell you what was wrong. They're from Naples. <laughs> They're old and white. Yeah, yeah. You're trying to talk about Cafecito and the Palmetto. They don't know what the, they know Palmetto trees. That's it. And it's, it's you just got to be prepared for that. You, you got to be able to break out of the city. And you've been able to perform on cruises too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's crazy because. To me, I feel like that's fun. Like that 100%. has to be one of the funnest venues to perform at. It's, it is. It is. I love. I love doing them. I. I, I miss being home, but I, I'm I lo- assuming like you do the comedy, but you're also enjoying the cruise as well, or not really. So uh, the some cruises are different. For the most part, though, yeah, you get to. That's awesome. Get off and see the places. I don't. I. I I'm boring. Uh, but yeah, man, you're you're on a cruise. You're getting paid to be on a cruise. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many shows you do. You're getting paid That's the fire. same rate. And yeah, you get to hang around the people during the day, start meeting people. And then by the time you have the show, you can start ranking on them because you know a little bit about them. And the whole crowd gets into it. it it's, they're different shows, but man, they're fun. They're fun, especially because they're everyone's fucked up. I was up. gonna say, everyone's on vacation. Everyone's fucked, fucked up. up. They probably and see you around the crew. Yeah. Like, that's, that's awesome. And it's funny, as you, you always do more than one show per, uh, for the cruises. And so you'll do the first show in the beginning part of the cruise. And throughout the, oh my God, man, it's fucking the Camille. Ah! And they'll come out to the next show and it's like, they, they know you a little bit more and, and yeah. you're on a boat. At that point, they're just like, yo, it's my boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, bro, come eat with us. I'm like, I can't I'll get in trouble if I <laughs> consort with the guests. So ha- tell me about the hustle when it comes to comedy, like getting booked on a cruise or like getting booked somewhere outside of Miami. Like how often are you in your own little like zone trying to get these bookings? So I don't have an agent. If you've got an agent, they do all that work for you. I'm a fucking, I'm a nobody. In the grand scheme of things of the country, I'm a nobody. Nobody knows who I am Damn, bro, outside you think of so? Miami. I don't think so. Oh, outside I'm tell- of Miami. I'm telling you how it is. Okay. Like, outside of Miami, people don't know me. So, all the gigs that I've gotten outside of Miami, it's literally me finding emails, D- I, I, I DMing people. I, I'll DM the clubs. I, I Every couple weeks... I'll just DM every comedy club that I can find on Instagram. Like, hey, I'm a comedian from Miami. You can see. And, and, and the like, reason. You're like a salesperson for I'm, yourself. I have to sell myself. Yeah. And a lot of them are, are businesses. And it's like, what are your metrics in this city? And I have to be like, not very good. But I can give out free tickets and, and pack out the room. And they'll buy next time. And then there's some clubs that are like, oh, we'll, we'll worry about filling the club. You just come and be funny. And nice. those are a lot easier for me because I, I, I don't have much of a footprint in those cities yet in those markets yet and brother it's it's to answer your question it's the hustle is me eat dming emailing phone calls all me how i got on the cruises was i was doing a show and my buddy nary who's been doing the cruise circuit for years was on the show his agent was in the room and he knew it he he, he was trying to get me on the cruises to make a little more money and so he had the agent there. He lets me know. And while I'm on stage, I'm, I'm doing a 30 minute set, 20 minutes in some kid in the restaurant next door that's connected to the club pulls a fire alarm and that cuts the power to the microphone. And so I have to end up doing 20 more minutes rather than 10 with no microphone, just screaming, projecting theater boy. I had to fucking speak from your diaphragm. And with the alarm going off or not? No, no, the alarm turned <laughs> off, but there was just no power. Okay. And so I have to like scream to everybody, I do my set, go a little bit longer than I prepared, which is fine. I got the material. That wasn't the issue. It was about no microphone. And at the end of the show, the way I handled it, and, and brother, 
that might have been one of my best shows ever. Just when shit like that happens, a lot of people hear about that. It's like, well, the microphone shut, shut off, the power went off. That must have killed your set. If you're good at what you do, which, <laughs> I mean, whatever, uh, <laughs> that shit enhances it. If you can handle it, that brings everyone together. I don't have to do that. I don't have to worry about keeping everyone in. Everyone's now going through something at the same time. And I just kept with them with stories. I, I dealing with everything, crowd work, having fun. And I crushed it. They got the power back on. I brought on the next guy. And at the end of the show, I'm talking to the agent. And she's just like, man, that was awesome. I, I'll talk to you on Monday and, and we'll get you some work. And so they call the cruises. I don't have to worry about that. Nice. As far as land gigs and, and stuff in the comedy clubs, I got to hustle my ass off. I got to reach out to people. The squeaky, wheel, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah, for sure. And how's comedy down here in Miami? <clears throat> like, is it a big comedy scene? There's a lot of comics. The, uh, Florida's got some cool comedy scenes in like Orlando and Tampa. Uh, they kind of get all the shine. But Miami, we got some good comics out here, bro. We got we got a lot of good young comics that are, I, I keep looking in the direction of Thank You Miami, um, <laughs> that are out there every week working. We got some funny comics. We got some not funny comics as well. It, was what it, it is what it is. Yo, it's a Friday night. They're actually out there right now doing stand-up. Yeah, yeah. Thank God we don't <laughs> hear them. So. <laughs> <laughs> no man it's it, the comedy scene is alive and there's a lot of people that have the aspirations that we do and those people are fun to watch and then there's just a lot of the people that it's their hobby and they're they're whatever but it's we got a big scene down here a lot of people trying to make it yo i'm also a big fan of your skits because of course instagram social media is yeah. a tool to enhance what you already do so and also that goes hand in hand with acting yeah. So tell me about the skits. Like, how long have you been doing them? And how do you like doing them? Bro, that that's what changed my life. The skits. I, I had been busting my ass, becoming a good stand-up comic. And I was. But because I didn't have a social media presence, I couldn't get booked to headline anywhere because I couldn't sell tickets. Oh, okay, yeah. I link up with Red, uh, Mr. Red. Shout and, out Mr. Red. And he teach, he's like, look, uh, he wanted to get into stand-up. And he's like, look, if you can help me out with stand-up, I'll teach you everything I can with skits. And we just started working together like that. And he taught me how to, because uh, I knew how to act. I knew how to, like, read plays and scripts and shit. But to transfer that time, transfer that time to social media is different. Like, a funny play is not going to make a funny skit online. Uh, a funny film is not going to play a funny, make a funny skit. But working with Red, teaching me the ropes... Uh, being able to then do skits on my own that go stupid wild online and just increasing my visibility, increasing my, putting my name out there more. It's, that's changed everything. It's back in the day you needed to get on Johnny Carson. You needed to get on the late night shows to get noticed. Now everyone's on their phone. You can get noticed on someone's phone and you, you can change your life by attacking those skits. And I love it. I love doing that. I, lo I love having fun, being silly, coming up with a character, putting it out there and, and seeing where it takes me. Yeah, bro. The, so how, how long have you been doing the skits now? Because you said changed oh, your shit. life. Was uh, like... In COVID. Oh, shit. In COVID. Okay. That's uh, good, man, that's, good so, that's so wild. COVID. A lot of people were bitching about the, uh, by the way, side note, the fact that we stopped calling it the Kung Flu kills me i thought that was the funniest thing in the, the world what? the kung flu oh i never heard of that you what's, never heard what's it the kung flu because it came from china and they called it the kung flu <laughs> nah, you never heard it <laughs> it was the first I time think, i ever heard i think that was kung a trumpism flu. and i thought that was hilarious um <laughs> but man you know what's crazy about covid covid was what put people to different levels if they worked hard enough i noticed the comics that are making it out of miami right now all used covid to their advantage Started attacking social media, started attacking stage time. Because when things started opening up, people were still a little scared to go out there. But if you fucking wanted to make your name, clubs were opening up, comedy clubs, and you put yourself there and you you got on that stage, people were elevating it. And so I met Red right after COVID because he did a show at the Improv right after COVID. Started doing skits there. So maybe, I guess, four years ago as when I started doing the skits, really attacking it. And from those four years on, my life is just as a comic been getting better and better i if it wasn't for covid and meeting red and figuring out the skit game maybe i would have figured it out on my own but i can only talk about the things that did happen in my life 
and meeting Red, learning the skit game, learning the social media game, applying it on my own, not having to, not doing skits with just Red, but with like other people, working with other social media pages. Put, I, that's, these four years have been everything. That's, yeah, that's huge. Like I said, it's a tool, but it's a huge tool, especially yeah. for what you do. So how often do you think about skits? Is this something where it's like you think of a skit and then you do it or you sit down and actually think so, of a couple of them? Like I, Well, you know, it comes in waves. There's, there's times where I'm posting four or five times a week and in those months i everything is just clicking and i've coming up with a skit today i'm coming up with three skits today filming them and banking them for later and and i just everything's rolling and then there's months where i go by and it's like i, I don't even want to look at my phone like fuck skits fuck everything and and those are the hard ones because you still got to keep putting shit out because like kind of like how squeaky wheel only gets agrees you're only as relevant as you make yourself so you can have all the followers in the world, if you don't post anything, no one's going to remember you because that's society nowadays, right? Like, who gives a fuck if, if, if yeah. you're not right in front of my face? And so when I'm, on the, when I'm in those state of minds where everything's a skit, bro, I, I, I'm firing. But those times where, because it's weird, like you ask, how, how often do you make skits? It depends. It depends. I can make and come up with skits every day and, and, and just keep firing them out. And then I'll go a couple weeks, a month or two, without thinking of anything funny. And what happens when you go through those like months where you're just kind of like not really as productive? Do you have something that you do that like yeah. snaps you back into it? I I rely on my buds. I rely on my friends. I'll hit up people like like Red. I'll hit up people like like Lynette Storybook. Um, her and I, Lynette. her and I. It's funny. Her and I did a couple skits. Uh, like a month ago, like we just like I hit her up like, hey, I got an idea for a skit. She's like, yo, I got an idea for a skit with you. I was like, I got one for you. And, and so we just met up and, and we were talking about it. We're like, man, we're kind of, we're both in a rut and just working together. We 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 went in. I went in with one skit. She came in with another skit. And while we were together, just collabing, like started thinking of other things. And that's that's to me how I get out of it. I start. I call on my friends. I call on Flava. I call on Red. And I just let's just hang out. Let's see what comes. I've got maybe one idea that, let's see if we can film it, but let's get together and film that one shit idea. All of a sudden I, I get there and uh, this, is my, this is my idea. And Flav will be like, yo, it'll be crazy if we add this to it. And it's like, oh shit, you're right. And then it's like, but wait, what if we do that? And then we do another skit like this. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and it, to me, it's the community. Yeah, yeah. And with so many content creators down here, uh, it, you can always collab with someone. And to me, that's how I get out of my ruts is collabing, getting back with my friends. Cause like, I, I, I don't have a job other than comedy. I, I've worked hard for that, but it also becomes a lonely life. If I don't go out of my way to reach out to my friends and see people, the only people I'm seeing are my wife and kids. I love them. I need something else too. También. You need your friends, you need your boys. Uh, and, and that's how I get out of it. I, I call my friends. We get together. Hey, let's let's just hang out. Let's go. Like Red loves golfing. Hey, let's go golfing. Let's see. Not to make skits. Let's just get together. And you know how boys are when we talk shit. We start pissing outside, and and <laughs> skits come skits come out of our dick. And it's like, oh, that's yeah, yeah, a good yeah. idea. Let's do that. No, for real. That's actually. I remember we went to do skits on a baseball field once. And yeah. I went in there. Not really. I'm I'm a student to the game, so I don't really know much. I, I went more to observe. And then like yeah, ideas are getting thrown around left and right. And I remember that day, actually, when we wrapped up and we were completely done, Corey just thinks of one random idea with flavor and Red. That is the one that gets posted the next day and hits like a million yeah. views. Actually, it got it went so viral that my dad showed me not knowing that I knew them. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, I mean, that's cool. I was like, yo, I was there, but like not that's, in it, but I was there. See, that's the best, bro. I, I, uh, I, I, I remember when I first started working with, with Red, I had this idea of making a sa like ordering a salad and asking the waiter to modify it enough to, to turn it into a burger. <laughs> and so Red was the waiter. I was the fat guy ordering the salad burger. And that skit went crazy. That skit went stupid viral. And someone, the, some lady that works with my dad ends up showing my dad the video. Like, oh, my God, you got to see this. I saw this over the weekend. I knew that's you were going to love it. And my dad goes, that's, that's my son. <laughs> the lady goes crazy. You're Mr. Red's dad. <laughs> the disappointment <laughs> in her face. Like, 
No, I'm the Gordo's dance. She's like, oh. I mean, that's cool too, but like, oh. <laughs> that's crazy, bro. Yo, so now that you you have all of these things going for you, um, you've been in the- I ain't got shit going for me, bro. Bro, what? Compared to a lot of people that are listening that are trying to come up on comedy or like don't have as many experiences as you, I feel like they look up to you at this point. I feel like they there's better people to look up to, bro. Of like course, that's, bro. I mean, that's me. I've never been able to enjoy where I'm at, even though I worked my ass off to get here. I've always- you see the bigger picture. I've always been why, looking yeah. forward, and, and that's a problem of mine. So maybe there are people that are like, ah, I'm working to get to that spot. But, like, no one's really working to get here. We're all working to get farther. So I – sorry, I cut you off. No, what? bro, you're being humble, but nah. I respect that. But I feel like you're definitely doing your thing. And what do you think is uh, next for you from here on out? I'm I'm just trying to move forward, brother. I, I – I, it's a like, what's, tough question like, because – Like, what's forward for you? Like, how – I figure out how to go national, figure out how to make my name as a comedian more than just the Miami comic, more than just the Cuban fluffy, the white fluffy. And that's, that's what I get called online. Um, <laughs> and, and the problem is I don't know how I've been. So the, what I've been doing recently, I've just been applying to like festivals that are around the country uh, because if I can't, play your club and sell out your club. I get that. I, I don't have a big following in your city yet. Go out to a comedy festival there, perform there, and network with people there. So that way, if, if, if I can't get a headline day, you know, but this guy's doing a show, it's like, hey, if you're willing to pay for your ticket out here, you can be on the show and just growing like that. So like, I'm, I'm going to be in Cali in August, part of the Burbank Comedy Festival and that's, see what that fire. does there. If, if there are that's any big. agents there, that's just... Trying to, right now, the, the, the name of the game is work until someone sees it and, and can help take you to the next level. Because yeah. I can DM clubs all I want, but I don't really have a relationship with them. But if an agent sees it and believes in me, it's like, hey, I've got relationships with the clubs. I can get you in with the clubs. Do you try to reach out to agents as well as clubs? Like trying to get your... I've been, bro, I've been ghosted by everyone in the industry. I've gotta, been ghosted by everyone. The, you got to shoot the shot. Exactly. Oh, I sh brother, I shoot. Exactly. As long as you're but shooting. I fucking shoot. shoot. <laughs> but I miss so many times. I, I, get go I tell you, I've been ghosted by everybody. And that's why every couple of weeks I, I reach out again. I'm it delusional. I, I do it. that one response. So but you it, you've got to earn it. You've got to earn their attention. And I haven't earned it yet. I, I've always, I, as much as I can't appreciate where I am, I'm always very aware of where I am. And, and I, 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 I pride myself on that self-awareness. I haven't earned it yet. If I had have earned it, it would have come to me, right? I, if it hasn't come to me, it's because I haven't earned it. I haven't done the right things yet. So I just got, I keep working, putting out skits, putting out stand-up clips so that people know I'm not just a skit comic. I'm not the, my Cuban skit guy. I'm the comedian. Keep putting that out. Hope God, praying for like a Matt Reif, a Troy Bond, uh, uh, Ralph Balbosa type moment where one of these videos goes stupid and the right person sees it. And there, I've earned the trust of the right people. Yeah, but you're definitely putting in the work. So you're laying down the groundwork for when that moment happens, they can already look at you and see They can look at my page and see, yeah. oh, okay, this guy's not a no, but he's been working. Yeah, he's like been got, doing you it. You got a good resume. Like, you're basically preparing for that moment. Exactly. I respect that. That's what I'm trying to do, bro. Hey, shout out to the Miami Hustle. That's why you're here, bro. We That's got that, though, baby. <laughs> Yeah, bro. So what are some comedians that you would look up to in the game? Like, I mean, do you obviously you know about him, but do you look up to Gabriel Iglesias? Yeah, yeah. you have to. If you're if you're a Latino comic, you have to. Yeah, yeah. Because that man, you, you've got the, the George Lopez's of the world that put out. And, and there's a lot of Latino comics that that made it really big and have made huge names for themselves in the Latino world. Gabriel broke out of that. And that's something I've always taken to heart as my biggest inspiration of, I love being Cuban. I love being Cuban. I take pride that my parents hit me with a chocolate on a belt every day. I love that shit because it made me who I am. But I have bigger dreams, bro. I really do. And, and whether they come true or not, I'm going to work for those dreams. And Gabriel was able to be a Hispanic comic and not be known as the... Hispanic guy, but as just the funny guy happens to be Hispanic. And so that's something that he's done. Like 
I look up to him more than I would ever a uh, George Lopez, uh, 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 Carlos Mencia. Uh, even though Carlos Mencia kind of did it, uh, if he didn't get caught up in that scandal, might have done what Fluffy did too. Um, just because you look at Fluffy, his jokes aren't about necessarily about being Latino. Well, the thing about him is that he looks Latino. Yeah. You don't. I don't. So that 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 helps. Oh, bro, it helps I'm, that you don't. You look American, but you're Latino. Exactly. Instead of just being. And and so when I'm on stage, my thing is my jokes aren't about being Hispanic. My jokes are about my experiences. My lens just happens to be that of a Cuban American. So when I say my stories. And and I have to, and I mentioned my dad telling me something. I'm not gonna say it differently. If my dad said "Oye mijito," I'm not gonna say. And so my dad said, "Hey son," no, I'm gonna say "Oye mijito." If I'm talking about my sister, I'm gonna say "Oye Gabriela," and, and I, I use my identity in that way. But I'm not talking about. I don't know how to put it, bro. Fuck that. Like, I, I, maybe the zins hits too hard, pero I, I don't know if I'm. It's, yeah, saying it probably, but like, like how Gabriel Iglesias will say a story about being pulled over by the cops. And when he says names, when he says things, he's not shying away from his Hispanic accent, but it's not necessarily about being Hispanic. It's about being a human being. Uh, that's what I try to do. Yeah. That's what I've always tried to do. And that's something that if I wanted more clout in Miami, I could have attacked the Miami shit, Miami stereotype. But... I'd be where I am today. I'd probably be farther back from where I am today because yeah, outside yeah. of Miami, no one would give a fuck. Yeah, you're thinking bigger picture. I've, sure. I've always thought bigger picture. That's what's up, bro. Yo, we're lucky to have you on the Miami Hustle because, again, I thought, I mean, it's an honor to have you already. It shouldn't be. I thought you're already big. You're telling me you're not. So you're only going to get bigger. I like where your head is at. Uh, you want to talk about your next show at the Improv so the people know uh, what's up? I don't have, I, I, my next headline date is in Tampa in October. Uh, but I, I'm at the improv often. Like, I'll be there with Flava yeah, in, that's what I was in August. <clears throat> so we can go see you. Um, you gotta you August. go out there. August 8th. It's Flava's first time not doing stand up. I've, already, Flava, I've already seen him do stand up, and it's good. That dude's first time doing stand up went to the open mic, and everyone was sucking. And I'm, I'm getting nervous. I'm like, maybe the crowd's bad. This guy's gonna get fucking de dejected. He's gonna feel bad. He's gonna cancel his show. <laughs> And he went up there and he crushed a shit crowd that wasn't laughing at anything. He went up there and he crushed. I'm like, oh, okay, it's gonna be a good show. That's so so August eighth, go out there and support our boy, Flava. I'll be there. Uh, Lynette will be there. Um, Yo, we'll be there. 100%. You'll be there. Thank God. Okay, good. Uh, it's gonna be a great show. August eighth uh, at the Miami Improv in Doral. Yes, sir. Hey, we're definitely gonna show love August eighth and. Wherever you go, we're going to try to support you as much as we can whenever you're in town. Thank <laughs> Whenever you're performing here, whenever you pull up to Thank You Miami, you know we're going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, bro, again, I feel like we're lucky to have you on now. You're only going to get bigger. You're only going to get better. Uh, speaking about getting bigger, you're actually going to get smaller. Bro, man, we, we, we're getting fun. You know what's so crazy, dude? I was, and not everything in the world is about followers, right? But you look at it, you notice it. Like, everyone's like, I don't even look at that. Everyone fucking looks at it, you know? And so I look at it. And I, I, I've had videos that go viral. And when they go viral, that's when you get the big numbers and following. And I had been, I had a video last year that got 16 million views. And that shit shot me up to like 80. And, and like, I get like other views, videos, I get like two, three million here and there. And, and so I was at 99 point something followers forever it was at 99.8 it was at 99.7 i got to 99.8 i'm like awesome i'm gonna get that 100k whatever it was nothing i was still posting but nothing was hitting and i started losing followers i don't know what if there were bots that were unfollowing me or people that were just not liking me anymore i i, I started losing followers and i didn't do this and I didn't do it for the for the followers. I did it mainly for my own accountability. But I put online, hey, I'm tired of the fat people nowadays. Fat people are, are making it not fun to be fat anymore because they're, they feel so entitled because they let themselves go that I no longer want to be fat and I'm going to start losing weight. I've already lost 12 pounds and I'm going to keep going. Let's go. I put that on social media and, and everyone was like fucking with it. They're like, yo, I... I I fuck with your journey. 
and all of a sudden now I'm, I'm, I'm I, I passed that hundred k, and that's like oh, so I just oh, needed to be, shit. I just needed to care about myself okay. for people to care about me. <laughs> awesome, and and yeah, that's man. Awesome, so bro. I put on social media, I'm gonna lose weight, and I do that because, like I said in the beginning, I'm I need to be held accountable. When I was in the best shape of my life, it was because my football coach made me go to practice every day, run sprints every day, do a three hour practice, run some more, and and. I, I feed off people holding me accountable. And so I put it online that I, I'm going to lose weight. So, yes, I'm going to get smaller. The goal is I've got, I think, 120-something days now till my birthday, and I want to be under 300 by then. And I'm at 385. I was at 385 in the beginning of the week. I haven't weighed myself since. And then I got nice. fucking plantar fasciitis. <laughs> like a pussy. Yo, shit happens, bro. Bro. Yo, I agree. Like, when you're around people and you're working out with them, it really does motivate you. It pushes you. It like, does. When I was playing baseball and my coach was telling me to run 10 laps, I was running 10 laps and I was trying to be the first one because I had people running with me. Nowadays, I tell myself to run 10 laps, I might run four. And you're like, ah, I did good. I think I'm <laughs> yeah, sweating. Yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, yo, I'm down to work out with you as soon as you heal up. Whenever you're bro. ready, we'll be out there on the field. We'll get some work in. We can get some lifts in now. But, yeah, get, uh, give me a couple weeks. My foot was like, hey, you still weigh 380 pounds. You can't be running this much. And I was like, okay, I forgot. It's so funny how many people are like, you you know you're an adult now, right? You can't be doing those drills. I'm like, I can. I just can't right now. I don't know. But, yeah, man, we're, we're, we're going to get skinny, brother. Well, Under 300 by, by November 17th. Yes, sir. We're going to keep following you, your journey. And next time you come on the show, maybe six months later, 12 months later, we're going to see where you were and where you're headed. And also, you're going to be under 300 pounds. So that's going to be, gonna under be a big milestone, too. I'm a, I'm, dude, this chair this chair is dying right now. I've heard it creak. <laughs> and it's about to break. Gravity's a son of a bitch, especially when it involves me. But this chair, this chair, I feel, put a seat though. I'll be a lot lighter next time I see you. I promise. Yo, yo, with that, let's uh, let's wrap it up. Last question is, what does Miami mean to you? Oh, man, Miami, Miami's headquarters. So I, I, as much as I'm trying to expand and get a, not get away, as much as I'm trying to evolve past Miami, I still I, this is my city. Like I, I, you can't buy a house here. You can't. But as me and my wife got two kids, a third on the way. We're thinking about moving to Port St. Lucie because that's the only place where you can buy housing. Every, every spot of land is either Everglades or already built on in Miami. And something as much as we could have bought anywhere, man, Miami's just home, bro. I, I can't leave here. I can't leave here. If I move to New York and L.A., maybe my comedy career takes off. But Miami's home, bro. Damn, Miami's love. fucking home. That's some Miami love right there. Right, let me let me see if I can make it from here. Yes, sir. That's the plan. Yo, until next time. Thank you again for your time, bro. Dale, bro. <laughs>